So we are the data enjoyers. And before we start, we actually broke our group into two teams. So I'll be starting off with team one. Our goal is pr to predict future diseases from current diseases and symptoms while spreading awareness about the situation in smaller overlooked countries. Your lifestyle right now majorly affects your well-being in the future. You shouldn't waste your life by making choices that affect your health, especially when you're the one who makes the decision. Choose your path and make the decision that keeps you and the people around you happy. Our ML models. So we chose the, the decision tree and the random forest. The decision tree model is a simple method that can be used to classify objects according to their features. For example, you might have a decision tree that tells you if your object is an apple or not based on the following attributes like color, size, and weight. Random forest is a popular and effective assemble machine learning algorithm. It is widely used for classification and regression predictive modeling problems with structured data sets. A data uh, as it looks in the spreadsheet or database table. Why it was used in our project. Our whole purpose was to tell people that what they were doing is affecting their lives. So when they type in the inputs or the causes, for example, smoking, the, the output will be the disease they may possibly have in the future. The decision tree would be a good model. This is because it could immediately give you the output, not based on the features, but recent data. Random trees is the bet is best if used for classification projects as explained above. Since ours have specific inputs and outputs, this model would be the best. When people put in the input, it classifies it and gives the output. Here are some stories from people who have suffered from diseases. Meet Ellie N. Ellie, age 57, lives in Florida and never smoked. At 35, she started having asthma attacks triggered from breathing secondhand smoke at work. The severe attacks forced her to leave a job she loved. Meet Brandon C. Brandon, age 31, lives in North Dakota and began smoking at age 15. At 18, he was diagnosed with Borger's disease, which resulted in the amputation of both his legs and several fingertips. Meet Christy G. Christy, age 35, lives in Tennessee. She tried using electronic cigarettes to help her, help her smoke fewer regular cigarettes, but it took a collapsed lung and early chronic obstructive pulmonary disease before she quit smoking completely. And finally, meet Amanda B. Amanda, age 30, lives in Wisconsin and began smoking in fifth grade. She smoked during pregnancy and her baby was born two months early. Her tiny girl spent weeks in an incubator. Here are some visuals we use while working with the data. For our visuals in EDA, we used heat maps, scatter plots, data frames, and more. All of these contributed to our exploration massively, helping us with calculating data and finding specific correlations. So correlation matrix one. The correlation matrix shows that if your general health is bad, in, the, in this case, larger than the number, the worse the health, factors such as heart condition is also not going to be good. For example, if you have a very high BMI, the chances of your general health numbers being low is not likely. So keep your general health on low numbers. So correlation matrix two. A highlight that this matrix shows is that high blood pressure leads to higher numbers on heart condition. Like correlation matrix one, lower numbers are better. As we can also see the, the connection between BMI and the times moderate exercise is dark, meaning both the BMI and exercise is low, which is good. And bar graph one, we found that most people with lung disease smoked extensively. Therefore, if you wanna keep your lungs healthy, you should avoid smoking. Now I'll pass it on to Nancy. On week one, we started off by exploring various data sets. Then we started to connect multiple of them into a story. We performed an EDA and started to clean, isolate, and visualize the data. We started looking at the different kinds of machine learning, eventually deciding on a project plan. On week two, we started to explore different kinds of machine learning models and it took a while to decide which would be the best fit for our project. We came to an agreement on decision trees as they worked best for our project. After practicing with various models, we were able to feed our data to a machine learning model. During week three, we learned how to design a website using HTML and worked, and worked ty tirelessly at perfecting our website. We learned a lot about web design and slowly started to familiarize with HTML. 
Some experiences that our group had were creating visuals, working with data sets, creating website, collaborating, collaborating with peers, and using Python. We expanded our knowledge on the coding language. Overall, we learned how to communicate with our teammates more efficiently, how to find and import data sets and feed them to models, etc. At first, our forms of communication were centered around the Zoom chat feature. Then we decided to make a Discord group so we could communicate more easily when we were not isolated in breakout rooms. Generally, our form of communication was efficient. For the process, these are the steps we went through from searching for data frames to creating a full machine learning project. One, searching for data sets. Two, isolating and cleaning the data. Three, visualizing the data. Four, forming inputs and outputs. Five, learning about and selecting machine learning models to work with. Six, preparing the data to feed to the machine learning model. Seven, designing website to show off work. Team two, predicting death rates based on GDP and population, visualizing data from all countries, telling stories about encounters with danger from minorities and developing countries. Visuals and EDA. We've marked down our visuals with scatter plots and data frames. We've also used heat maps to find specific correlations between GDP, total population, and more. Scatter plot one, GDP and malaria. As GDP decreases, malaria death rates increase. Scatter plot two, GDP and conflict and terrorism. As GDP decreases, conflict and terrorism death rates increase. Scatter plot three, total population and COVID-19. As total population decreases, COVID-19 death rates increase. Scatter plot four, GDP and drug use disorders. As GDP increases, drug use disorder death rates in decrease. Heat map, correlations between causes of death. All right, now I'm passing it off to Cairo. Okay, so stories. Um, so we include stories about survivals and tragedies from minorities and overlooked countries to fit the reader in someone else's shoes. So basically, I'm not gonna read the whole thing cause I'll probably bore you. Um, so I'm just, I'll summarize it a bit. Uh, so the Adisa family's dangerous encounter. They basically talk about going on a trip to Nigeria and the family wants to get vaccines, but um, the doctor says there was no such thing. Um, but there was a pill, but the family didn't know that it could be taken to prevent the disease. So they left for the trip, they had a nice time. They came back, the kids went to school and they started having symptoms. Um, the doctors thought it was the flu, but it was actually malaria, so. They went to the hospital and it got really bad, but they survived. So, and then now the parents want to encourage travelers to uh, take prevention for malaria. And then there's, I'm not sure how to pronounce it. I'm sorry, I might butcher it. Timpion? I don't know. From Kenya. So, uh, he survived tuberculosis, um, which is zoonotic tuberculosis, which is a form of tuberculosis transmitted from animals. Um, he's from the Maasai tribe, and so one day he realized that something was wrong when he started showing these weird symptoms and he went to the hospital. Doctors told him that he had tuberculosis, and so he got fixed, or healed, I don't know how you call it. Um, but, and then now he wants to, he's an advocate and he tries to spread awareness about tuberculosis and its community. And then Aicha from Yemen, I'm probably not pronouncing it right, but okay, so Aicha has four sons. I can read this since it's short. So one 12, uh, 12 year old, one 10 year old, one six year old, and Mayub, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, who's one year old and 10 months old. Mayub was sick, but he isn't today. Aicha has been taking Mayub to the clinic. I'm probably butchering it uh, since she and her family moved from the port city of Hodeida to Maui to escape violence, airstrikes, and bombings. It's really difficult. It's catastrophic. There are lots of airstrikes. I was hearing airstrikes and bombing and hearing about kidnapping. 
I just says. Her sons get st scared when they hear the sounds of planes flying overhead, never knowing what would come next. Aicha and her husband, a day laborer, had to borrow money to move to Maui and make it to their parents' house. Aicha and her family have been Maui for months and still do not have a house of their own. Things quickly take a turn once Aicha and her family arrive to Maui. Her husband was arrested shortly after their arrival, um, and she hasn't seen him in three months. Her children are sick and malnourished. Her six-year-old son, Anas, is suffering from a suffering from a sore throat today. Um, with her husband gone, money is even tighter. She can't afford food or water for her children. Um, Aicha hopes to one day have enough money to feed her sons and provide for them on their on her own. I hope that I can provide my kids with everything they need, especially after their father's not around. Aicha says her family is in dire need of help. When asked what she needed most, she responded with one word: anyone, uh, everything. Sorry. Um. Okay, so our machine learning model, it's a TensorFlow network, and a TensorFlow network is um, a network of nodes where each of those nodes operate multiplication, addition, etc. So there's the input layer, there's the hidden layer, and then there's the output layer. Um, and then we use a ten TensorFlow network for a project because it can help us identify a country's death rate based on their GDP and total population. TensorFlow networks also offer a variety of solutions in interesting formats. If our TensorFlow network could identify a higher priority disease or anything harmful in a certain country, we can see why that is so. As stated, as stated before, it can help us identify what a problem what problem a country is having based off of their internal issues. Um so we made a timeline of all the different like kind of steps in our process, right? So um, in the first week, we were working on like, we learned a bit of code and we learned the basics of data science to help us kind of start progressing into week two, right? Where we learned about exploratory data analysis to our advantage. And we, um, we use many EDAs as in the data frames, graphs, plots, heat maps, et cetera. These helped us by not analyzing the data and marking down the certain information, right? And in week three, we started working on our website, uh, web design, whatever you want to call it. Um, for a third week, we focused on the process of designing a website. One of these processes included learning and coding in HTML. And yeah. I like food, music, writing, drawing, and duck. I am a rookie Python coder. I ate too many cookies. <laughs> 